Imagine a nation where two-thirds of the land is nothing but sand, rock, and scorching heat. A place where rainfall only graces the northern regions, leaving the south completely parched. A country so water-starved that experts said it could never support more than a couple million people. Now imagine that same nation transforming into a water-exporting powerhouse, with more fresh water than it knows what to do with. This is the story of Israel's impossible journey from desert desperation to water abundance, and it happened through two separate engineering miracles that nobody thought would work. In the early 1950s, the newly formed state of Israel faced a crisis that threatened its very survival. The numbers painted a grim picture. 60% of the territory was desert, completely unusable without water. The Sea of Galilee in the north held plenty of fresh water fed by winter rains and mountain streams. Meanwhile, the Negev Desert in the south baked under relentless sun, with temperatures regularly hitting 115 degrees and beyond. Between these two regions lay hundreds of feet of elevation change, unstable rock formations, and nearly a hundred miles of hostile terrain. British colonial authorities had declared decades earlier that Palestine's water resources could never sustain more than two million inhabitants. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's founding father, looked at this same landscape and saw something different. His vision became the national rallying cry, make the desert bloom. Engineers, hydrologists, and international experts lined up to tell him it was impossible. The dream of moving water from north to south didn't start with Ben-Gurion. Back in 1902, Theodore Herzl wrote a novel called Alt Newland, imagining a future Jewish state where engineering genius conquered the desert. Four decades later, an American water engineer named Walter Loudermilk traveled through the region and proposed something radical. Pump water from the Sea of Galilee and send it south through a massive network of pipes and canals. People laughed at the idea. The Sea of Galilee sits 213 meters below sea level meaning any water would have to be lifted hundreds of feet straight up before it could flow anywhere. The energy requirements seemed astronomical. The construction challenges looked insurmountable. But in 1953, against all conventional wisdom, Israel began building what would become the National Water Carrier. The project took 11 years of brutal, relentless work. Engineers had to carve 87 kilometers of pipelines through terrain that shifted between soft sand and granite-hard rock. They blasted 13 kilometers of tunnels straight through mountains, working in suffocating heat with primitive equipment. They dug 8 kilometers of open canals across valleys and plains. The centerpiece of the entire system was the Sapir Pumping Station, a facility designed to lift water 250 vertical meters, equivalent to filling a 70-story skyscraper. Workers labored in temperatures exceeding 115 degrees Fahrenheit, drilling, blasting, and hauling millions of tons of rock and sand. Every meter of progress came at tremendous cost. The political situation made everything worse. Neighboring Arab nations viewed the water diversion as an act of aggression, threatening military action if construction continued. Syria began its own competing projects to divert the Jordan River tributaries. The United States government, trying to maintain regional stability, threatened to cut $50 million in aid unless Israel modified its plans. The pressure was immense, but construction never stopped. June 10, 1964 arrived like a national holiday. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol stood at the inaugural ceremony and turned on the pumps. For the first time in history, water from the Sea of Galilee began flowing south toward the Negev Desert. The system could move 19 million gallons per hour, roughly 1.7 billion cubic meters annually when running at full capacity. 80% of that water went straight to agriculture, transforming vast stretches of barren land into productive farms. Towns that existed only as dots on a map suddenly had the water they needed to grow. Beersheba, Arad, and Daimona expanded from tiny outposts into thriving cities. Kibbutzim planted orchards, vineyards, and vegetable fields across land that had been considered worthless. The desert was blooming, just as Ben-Gurion had promised. Israel's population grew rapidly, supported by the steady flow of northern water reaching every corner of the nation. But this success story contained the seeds of its own crisis. By the 1990s and into the 2000s, Israel faced a problem nobody had anticipated back in 1964. The population had exploded beyond even the most optimistic projections. Climate change began reducing rainfall in the north, meaning less water flowing into the Sea of Galilee. The national water carrier was running at maximum capacity every single day, with no room for expansion. Meanwhile, the environmental consequences of all this pumping became impossible to ignore. The Jordan River once a mighty waterway, had been reduced to a trickle, losing 90% of its historic flow. The Dead Sea was shrinking at an alarming rate, 
its surface area down 33% since the 1960s. Between 2000 and 2008, Israel suffered through some of the worst droughts in recorded history. The water commissioner issued warnings that sounded like something from the 1950s all over again. The system was approaching collapse. Agricultural allocation would have to be cut. Cities might face rationing. The miracle of 1964 was running out of steam, and this time there was no hidden lake in the north to save them. Then came a technology that seemed like science fiction. Desalination, the process of turning seawater into drinking water, had existed for decades but remained prohibitively expensive and energy intensive. Most plants around the world produced water at costs that made it useful only for wealthy Gulf states with oil money to burn. Israeli engineers and scientists looked at the Mediterranean coastline and saw potential nobody else recognized. In 2002, the government approved a massive $3 billion program to build desalination plants using reverse osmosis technology. The concept was elegant but incredibly difficult to execute. Seawater would be forced through special membranes under enormous pressure. These membranes had microscopic pores, roughly 1 100th the width of a human hair, small enough to block salt molecules while allowing pure water to pass through. The engineering challenges were staggering. Seawater is corrosive, filled with organisms, constantly trying to clog or destroy the delicate membranes. Any plant would need to process millions of gallons daily while maintaining perfect purity standards. The first major facility opened in Ashkelon in 2005, and it was the largest desalination plant on Earth at the time. Engineers watched nervously as the pumps began forcing Mediterranean seawater through banks of membrane filters. The water that emerged on the other side was crystal clear, perfectly drinkable, completely free of salt. It worked. More importantly, Israeli engineers had figured out how to do it cheaper than anyone else in the world. The success triggered a construction boom. Palmachim came online in 2007. Hadera followed in 2009. Then came Sorek in 2013, a facility so advanced it redefined what desalination could accomplish. The Sorek plant alone could produce 150 million cubic meters of water annually, using 50,000 individual membrane filters working like precision jet engines. The breakthrough that made it all economically viable came from an unexpected source, volcanic rock filters that eliminated biofouling without requiring harsh chemicals. This innovation, combined with energy recovery systems that recycled pressure from the brine discharge, dropped costs to the lowest levels anywhere on the planet. Ashdod's plant opened in 2015 and suddenly Israel had five major desalination facilities pumping out water faster than the old national water carrier ever could. Today, Israel produces more than 585 million cubic meters of desalinated water every year, with two more plants under construction that will push that number even higher. Desalination now provides between 85 and 90 percent of all household water throughout the country. The Sea of Galilee, drained to dangerous levels during the drought years, has refilled to heights not seen in decades. Farmers still use the national water carrier, but now it's supplemented by an entirely new source that will never run dry as long as the Mediterranean exists. Israel recycles 85 percent of its wastewater, the highest rate of any nation on Earth. The drip irrigation technology invented here to save every precious drop has spread to farms across six continents, and the nation that once faced existential. Water shortages now confronts a question nobody imagined asking 60 years ago. What do we do with extra water? There's serious discussion about exporting water technology and even the water itself to neighboring countries. Jordan already purchases Israeli desalinated water under long-term agreements. The government plans to expand total desalination capacity to 1.1 billion cubic meters by 2030, effectively making water scarcity a problem of the past. Two separate engineering revolutions, separated by four decades, transformed Israel from one of the most water-stressed nations on Earth into a water technology superpower. The 1964 National Water Carrier moved water across impossible distances through sheer determination and brilliant engineering. The 2000s desalination revolution created an unlimited source that turned the Mediterranean Sea into the world's largest freshwater reservoir. California now uses Israeli technology for its own desalination projects. China has purchased Israeli systems for coastal cities. India is implementing similar approaches in drought-prone regions. The impossible became inevitable, and the desert didn't just bloom. It thrived. From 2 million people barely surviving to 9 million people with water abundance, Israel proved that human ingenuity can overcome even the harshest environmental limitations. The nation that had no water became the nation teaching the world how to create it from thin air, or in this case from salt water and stubborn refusal to accept defeat.